There are countries in which I would not be allowed to live, not while doing my job in any case. Every day, journalists risk their lives to get access to information for the public. 55 journalists were killed doing their job in 2021, according to UNESCO. More than 1,500 have been killed since 1993. Luckily for me, I live and work in part of the world that is democratic and that access to information and freedom of the press are valued, and not only valued, but necessary. And this is the part of the world where we have democracy. In a democracy, we organize ourselves based on everyone's participation. And it's, this is a must have for a government where the people hold the power and exercise that power through voting. Democracy works best when the decision makers, the citizens, have as much information as possible for when they're gonna make those choices at the ballot box. But now democracy is also in decline. According to Freedom House, a nonprofit doing research on democracy and human rights, democracy has been in decline for the past 16 years. A total of 60 countries suffered declines while 25 only improved, a recent report said. So the stronger the democracy, the freer the press and vice versa. This is where I come in. Let me take you behind the scenes and show you what it's like to be a journalist today. I hope that after this preview, you will join us in protecting freedom of the press to protect freedom for all of us. One of the main jobs of being a journalist is holding governments accountable. The press is a watchdog for those in power. They expose what is being done in our name. And this can be as simple as how tax budgets are spent. You know, do we build a playground? Do we build a hospital? What are we investing our money in? But it's also policies that regulate deeper issues like hate speech on social media or an individual's right to their data like the famous GDPR here in the EU. Knowing how these decisions are made is the best way for people to be informed, to be able to make a decision when they are voting, and also to understand what is happening and make a change if they're unhappy with the direction their government is going in. So if you've ever protested, if you've ever voted, if you've ever signed a petition for a new law, you have actively participated in government. I've always loved democracy. And perhaps it's because I, I I really always felt like I wanted to make a difference. As a student, I felt like there was a power imbalance between the relationship between our teachers, and, and so I ran for student council every time I could to try to make students' voices heard. I didn't always want to be a journalist, but my ease with words made writing easy for me and made it the best way that I could make a difference in this world. To be fair, I started with a food column in the student paper, but three years later, I was writing for Al Jazeera. So I have seen firsthand where political journalism can have an impact. As a political correspondent, I called in to daily corona briefings with one of the most powerful people on the planet. It was incredible that I could craft a question and ask this one of the most powerful people that we can imagine, and he had to answer me. It's really, it blows my mind every time I think about it. So it it's really shows the power that political journalism can have to make a difference. Another important part of, of journalism's job is to get access to information for the average person, every citizen, the public in general. And for all of us to have access to that information, journalists need to have access first. We have to remember that governments and politicians work hard to control what we know, what we do not know, and how we feel about them. Media teams, communications officers, spokespeople, these are not only professionals that paint the portrait that we get to see. They are also filters restricting direct access to those in power. As we all know, knowledge is power, and who wants to share it? Finally, a key part of being a journalist is getting us all talking and, and discussing the big issues of our time 
and then deciding on a consensus basis about how we're going to act to change these and create the political agenda in our own country, in our community, in our region, at all levels. But lately, it has become harder and harder for me and all of my colleagues who are journalists to do this profession. So social media shows us content that we agree with and supports our beliefs, whatever they may be. We get that positive reinforcement from social media. And unfortunately, that means we never get to hear different voices. Without difference, there is no space for creativity. And without debate, there is ultimately no democracy. Only social media bubbles that surprise and outrage us when they burst. And to top it all off, there is a rise in extremist discourse around the world. Authoritarian states continue to crack down on freedom of speech and freedom of the press. In 2021 alone, 293 journalists were in jail, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists. And this is even an issue in established democracies. There is more polarization now than ever, and the press is coming under unprecedented attack. Governments use tactics to restrict our access to information, for example, by limiting press conferences, refusing to answer questions, or filtering who is able to ask them questions in a, in a press conference, for example. And unfortunately, as every journalist ha that I know has ever experienced, is I've been on the, on the receiving end of that hate speech on social media. Between name calling, questioning my professionalism, and saying that women shouldn't be covering a topic like politics, it's definitely a challenge. You know, I've been told my brain is too small, that I don't understand anything, that there's no way that this could be true, that it's all a conspiracy. Not to mention the body shaming and sexist remarks. And it's even more surprising is that one article can create this sort of division among all sorts of audience members. So I have been criticized for being too easy on the government, for being too supportive of a specific policy or of a specific politician, or being too negative about a specific politician, trying to sow division or take down the government in a time of crisis. And this is all for the same article. Definitely a very interesting experience. And it's very confusing when people are taking aim at you personally for something that you've written. And frankly, we have also forgotten as a society how to respectfully disagree with one another. So every day, my colleagues receive hateful messages, rude words, and even death threats for simply reporting and doing their job and getting the public the access to information that they need to be able to make their decisions while they're voting in a democracy. The culture of attacking journalists has never solved any problem in this world, making me into an easy scapegoat for the many different things that are wrong on this planet never solved anything. And unfortunately, this attitude only makes many journalists leave the profession. And many of them are women. Um, in a 2019 report, the International Women's Media Foundation found that there were two out of three female journalists reported being threatened or harassed online. You know, and obviously, we, I will recognize that part of this issue does come from the, the challenge of who is called a journalist. There are media outlets that are part of propaganda machines, and they often don't allow their reporters to follow the basic tenets of the profession, such as a dedication to truth and the pursuit of objectivity as best as we can. And unfortunately, all of this hurts our trust in everyone in the profession and journalism in general. And it creates this domino effect where it is okay to be rude to the press and use them as a scapegoat when there's something that you don't like that they've written. And many people are, have done that, and that's, that's, that's a, something that we deal with on a daily basis as a journalist. And there's a lot of talk around that about, you know, who has portrayed a politician in too positive a manner, in too negative a manner? What, who was too easy on which government or which policy? But frankly, we don't talk enough about it, how important it is to actually have journalists, especially in a democracy, good and bad as they may be. 
So the Watergate scandal in the United States in the early 1970s is a prime example of the importance of having journalists. Two young reporters at the Washington Post uncovered a series of political crimes and evidence tying a burglary into the opposition party office back to the White House. Their reporting led to criminal charges of 40 administration officials and the eventual resignation of President Richard Nixon. Their reporting eventually won the 1973 Pulitzer Prize for investigative journalism. So yes, call me biased. I like democracy because it allows me to exist and do my job. But there have been times where I have feared for my freedom and even for my life, even as a citizen of one of the strongest democracies on the planet. And this is why I'm here today, to ask you to protect me and to protect all journalists. Because by doing our work, we protect freedom for all of us. There are almost 8 billion people in this world, which means there are almost 8 billion ways of seeing this world. Democracy allows everyone to contribute in their own way and develop their own personal sense of, of community and how they want to be existing on this planet. So in other words, it guarantees us our right to be who we are and to express ourselves and to be different from one another. Nowadays, we take this freedom for granted, but we need to remember that it was only 150 years ago in the United States that men of color couldn't vote, and in many parts of the world, only 100 years ago that women couldn't vote. So humanity has progressed by criticizing, by challenging the status quo, and being willing to ask those tough questions and engage in those debates to understand who we are as a species and even as an individual. So if journalists can't be critical and open the conversation for others to be critical as well, what are we gonna do to this progress as a species and as humans in general? So here are my three simple ideas that you could do to help protect the freedom of the press. First, vote. Vote whenever you can. By engaging with democracy in any way, shape, or form, we make it healthier, and we make it more representative of the people and views that make up our society. It, taking the time to vote also shows governments that we care about what they're doing. The citizens are watching them, and they are paying attention as to what is going on in their community, in their region, in their country, in the EU, for example, as a broader, broader demo democratic experiment that it is. And, you know, that voting automatically does keep journalism alive because it forces the governments to speak to journalists, to provide information to the, to the public, because we are one of the ways that people do get information about what the government is doing. And second, mind your language on social media. Criticize someone as if they were sitting there right in front of you. And there is absolutely no wrong, nothing wrong with having a different opinion than somebody else. Please share your opinions. That's very important. We need to exchange and debate in order to continue to grow in society and, and as humanity in general. But there is a way to be more polite and humane that does not include launching into threats and insults. A good debate is truly a lost art on social media. So please, debate. And third, read. Take the time to read the whole article or watch the entire video before you engage in conversation or criticism. Pew Research found in 2016 that the average reader spends as little as 57 seconds when they read an article online. That grows to only 123 seconds for an article of over 1,000 words. I, you know, I bet we all like to finish what we have to say, and I, I don't know how fast you read personally, but 57 seconds does not exactly seem like a fair amount of time to grant the reporter the time they need to finish what they have to say. And, you know, we have to add to this another challenge. There's rarely this, a single side to one story. 
one article may not tell you the entire story or even an accurate perspective. You need to check the sourcing. And you need to read as many articles as you can from as many different outlets and perspectives as you can. This is really key to be able to better understand the stories and issues that are swirling around on social media every day. And you know, I know we may often feel like we don't have the 57 seconds to spare. We're all really, really busy. But without taking the two, three, or even 10 times 57 seconds, how exactly are you gonna understand the stories that matter to you and the different sides that ha are playing into that story? So if you are enjoying your freedom, remember these three things when you engage with the press. Vote, mind your language, and read. Thank you very much. <laughs>